Welcome to Uncopyable Women in Sales. If you're looking for actionable insights and real world tools to turbocharge your sales starting tomorrow, well, you're in the right place. Your host, Kay Miller, earned the affectionate nickname Muffler Mama when she sold more automotive mufflers than anyone else in the world. In this podcast, Kay will talk to another superstar woman in sales as they reveal uncopyable strategies you can use to rack up more leads, snag dream clients, and take your sales numbers through the roof. Stay tuned and get ready to make more sales. And how about this? More money. My guest today is Barbara Weaver-Smith. And Barbara is an author, consultant, and founder and CEO of The Whale Hunters. She helps leaders and teams of B2B companies in all industries who want to grow their business by landing bigger deals. Barbara, welcome to the podcast. I'm just delighted to be here, Kay. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's my pleasure. And I would like to hear, first of all, before we get into the philosophy of the whale hunters and and all that good stuff, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, your eclectic background? It is eclectic, sure. Well, I started out as an English professor in a university, and then a college first, and then a university, and then I became an academic dean at the university. And so I was, I did that work for a long time. And then I left the university mostly because there was no place else for me to go there. And I took a job as president of a statewide not-for-profit organization in Indiana called the Indiana Humanities Council. And that was all about civic engagement and getting large groups of people together to figure things out for their community. So that's where I learned about big deals. <laughs> I did a lot of big deals at the Humanities Council. Then I had to raise all the money to support what we wanted to do. And then um, also I had to um, you know, raise money from individuals for the organization. So that was really my sales training. And I did that for four years. And I left there because there was a glass ceiling that I couldn't break through. And that's when I started my own business, which was in 1996. And it started out as a business doing kind of the same things I did in the Humanities Council. And over time, it evolved into a business of helping other businesses do things, including sales. Then in uh, about probably 2004 or five, I met Tom Searcy, who was my first business partner. And he was the one that had the idea of the Inuit whale hunters being a model for sales. And so together, we built that initial model of scout hunt harvest whales. And we wrote a book about it in 2008, which is the whale hunting. And then I bought him out in 2009. So it's been mine and my husband's entirely since then. Well, that is quite an interesting journey. And yeah. your point about fundraising is definitely related to sales because yeah. selling a vision, selling your cause and getting money is definitely in the realm of sales. So you came up with this uh, philosophy about whale hunting. And we talked just for a minute before we started recording that in the incopiable philosophy, we call your ideal target market your moose. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Now we have another animal, whales, <laughs> which are super cool. Yeah. Uh, and at first, I didn't know how to say that, but you helped me talk about the Inuit people. Correct. Yeah. And yeah, and how they hunted whales centuries ago. So tell, explain that and how you discovered that and and how you transfer that into your sales and sales training. Well, Tom got interested in it when he visited a museum, I think in Idaho, where they had artifacts from the Inuits. But when we started really learning about them, we discovered that um, they, they spent all year preparing for a whale hunt. It only happened in April for a short period of time, just a few weeks, because the whales were migrating and they go right past where these people lived on the far northwest coast of Alaska. 
So they knew the whales were coming, but they didn't know exactly when. So all winter long, they got ready. They were really good at teaching their young people about how their livelihood depended on the whales and the relationship between the whales and them, which was a spiritual relationship to them. And then they had scouts that would go out and watch for the whales to come. And then they would launch the boat, which was called an umyak, a little, um, like a, like a big canoe, only it was made out of seal skin, just kind of, you know, you would think it would be a flimsy boat. But they sent eight men out in the boat. They didn't send the women out in the boat. They were doing other things. But they'd go out into the sea, and when they spotted a whale, the harpooner's job was to get right up close to the whale. Sometimes they had to get out of the boat and on the back of the whale to do that. And then they had to learn how to bring it in, 100,000 pounds of whale. And it didn't die immediately. And so they had to bring it into shore and then everybody had to help to harvest it. They had, and whenever it, the scouts were watching to see where they would land, because they might not come back in exactly the same place. And so they had to have all their tools and all their equipment and all the, all the people and the kids and everybody came to harvest it. And so the kids learned how to harvest the blubber. And then as you got older, you learned to harvest different things. The most interesting part of the story is they never touched the head. When they were finished with all the body, the men who had brought it in took it back out, the head, took it back out into the Bering Sea and dropped it, allowed it to sink because they believed that the whales were reborn every year. And so I think that's what makes it a good analogy. Because at the end of the story, the whale is reborn. It's not dead. And so the whole system and process had been so consistent over long periods of time that scouting, hunting, and harvesting is where we got the model, which has worked really well for a long time now. Well, we're getting quite the history lesson here. And it is very interesting, very spiritual. And I was just gr- briefly looking uh, at the Inuit people and where they were. There are a lot of Inuit people yes. um, in different areas and tribes, correct? Correct, yeah. All over Iceland, all over uh, the northern part of Canada. But you've broken this down into a process, which, of course, we'll talk about how that relates to sales. But a lot of their time was preparation. You know, they exactly. had to prepare, right? right? And then, and that's getting ready for the big event. Right. And then right. when that event happens, they have a certain process and their rituals. For hunting, yeah. For hunting. And, and you know, I don't think that the whale had necessarily <laughs> made the whale re- be reborn, but it's a cool concept. It and is, yes. uh, so that so. was actually their belief at the time. Well, Who knows? We don't know everything. Maybe it happens, right? I don't know. So let's talk about then how you relate that. I mean, I think I'm getting hints of how that process relates to sales. Yes. And and so we've translated it into scout hunt harvest. Scouting is all the things you do to identify targets. So we teach people, this is all about large account sales, primarily. And so we teach the people in the company how to, uh, de- we start with the target filter where they define the characteristics of their, uh, their ideal client customer. And then they research, put that in a database and come up with a list of actual companies. And then they research each of those companies, create a dossier. And then they kind of rank them according to which one is the which ones are the most likely to be interested in them? And then they begin their outreach to those companies. So unlike sending a message out to market to see who comes in, they're deciding we want you and you and you and you and you and making a list that way, which is very effective if you've done good targeting. And it's, and it's systematic, so you always have a lead. So that's the scout part. 
and you're and you're choosing to target, like you said, big clients. And when you exactly. have big clients, exactly. you can afford to do your research, do your homework, exactly. find out where these companies are, the contact information, um, everything you need to know. Which, if you're selling maybe a small or low value product, it might not be as practical. But no. yeah, your focus is helping companies get bigger deals, right? right. Which is a wonderful way to grow. If you have a product or service that a big company can use, then it's a good way to grow. It's a solid way to go without too big of an investment. And we do recommend that the salespeople are not the scouts. The scouts are marketing people or admin people who like to research and do detail, which is not what salespeople like to do typically. So the, all that work is done before the salespeople get involved. Of course, they communicate a lot because they keep learning more. As they start contacting the whale, they begin learning more and that all feeds into the dossier. Right. Well, you got that right. As a salesperson, I can attest to the fact that, you know, doing research and doing the details, finding out all that information is not my favorite part of the job. Landing the deals is the favorite part of the job, but yeah. but I'm also developing that relationship with a customer. So it sounds like with this method, the salesperson has an advantage because they know the customer. So from the get go, they right. can communicate more effectively. Right. And, and uh, we, yes, and we also recommend that they involve subject matter experts in the sale to a big company. They're going to encounter. Anywhere from seven to a dozen influencers in the company. And if they can match up their key subject matter experts who are going to be delivering the service afterwards or, or who have developed the product, then they match up really well with the, the, um, buying team. So the harpooner goes in first and meets someone find someone who's willing to introduce him or her to more people. And as that buying group is identified, they bring their subject matter experts in to match up. So it's a completely different way of doing business. It's a team sale. It's company-wide. It requires that the company allow for subject matter experts to be involved when necessary. So you need agreement. We're all in this together. Everybody in the whale hunting village has a role and they're all important roles, not just the sales role. Although they are responsible primarily for the hunt, but the, the salesperson then becomes like a conductor, you know, like an orchestrator, a lot of moving parts, but that helps them compete with much larger competitors. As you move up market, not only do your customers get bigger, your competitors get more interested in you. And so you have to learn both things at the same time. And so a lot of big companies have a captured team. You know, they have the sales engineers and they have people that write the bids. They have people that write the proposals. And smaller companies, mid-sized companies, they don't have all that. So how do you replicate that? The advantage they have is the people that do the work are the people that are talking to the buyers. And big companies don't have that. So it's a huge advantage when they learn to do a huge advantage. So so you really have to get buy-in from every level. And so that's interesting. I know we've got a ton to cover, but I would like to know your sales process. So you're also doing the same thing, right? You're looking for your whales, right. the people that... You yeah, can most, help the most who will get the right. most value uh, and also mean the most revenue. Yeah. So our our business isn't entirely whale hunting, but the part of it that's whale hunting, we target mid-sized companies, all B2B. Mostly they're privately held. They're in all different kinds of industries, lots of meat, potato industries, also technology and Industries, a lot of work with marketing and um, digital marketing companies, lots of technologies all over the map. We even had a company that dug trenches underneath highways and stuff like that. 
Uh, their name was Midwest Mole. Wow. Anyway, That's a good name. Uh, so, so we do the same thing, uh, put our criteria together and then, um, go through a database to find a list of companies that, that meet that. So we do that in the U.S. We're also doing it in Australia, New Zealand and UK. Right. Yeah. So, so all that's how we world. get our primary customers. Yeah. Today's podcast is sponsored by the acclaimed book, Uncopyable Sales Secrets, How to Create an Unfair Advantage and Outsell Your Competition by Kay Miller. If you want to make more sales, you need to read this book. We'll even get you started with a free download of the first two chapters. Go to uncopyablesales.com slash chapters to grab this offer right now. Interesting that you say most of your customers are privately held and no offense to any corporate people listening, right. but right. you know, privately held family businesses are easier to work with because there are not so many layers of red tape and the people you're talking with can make a difference. But of course, it's every kind of company could benefit from this philosophy of finding the very best prospects and learning, learning, learning about them so that when you go in, when the salesperson goes in, they're really prepared with the value right. proposition and why they are the best choice. And as you said, when you have bigger accounts, then what we call, you call the whales, in uncopyable, we call it your ideal target, your moose. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you your moose is somebody else's moose and the business that you have, somebody else wants. So it's very important to be really drilled into the customer and their needs. Now, I know that you are really involved in technology. You are thrilled with the technology that has come along and especially AI. You're doing some interesting things with that. So I'd like to hear about how you are using it uh, with your, you know, your institute and then also how salespeople can use AI. So let's start with the Whale Hunters and the Whale Hunters Institute and your clone. Yeah. Well, the, the most interesting thing I've done with AI, and I am an early adopter for sure. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an inventor, but I'm an early adopter. I like to get on board. So I discover a company that allows you to build a clone. And what that involves is teaching the clone what you know. So my clone, Barbara AI, it knows all my books. It knows all my materials. It knows a whole lot of what I know, but it has an instant memory and instant ability to pull things together. And so it's designed to be a coach and you can interact with it either by typing or by just speaking like you were on the phone. It's not a visual clone. It's just auditory, but it speaks in my voice and it can answer any kind of question about whale hunting, which comes from my material. So. We put it inside the Whale Hunters Institute, which has tons of courses and worksheets and other kinds of tools, video, audio, all kinds of learning opportunities about whale hunting. And then Barbara AI is there to answer questions and coach them along the way. So uh, that's, that's the point of it. And as far as selling goes, I think for company level, I think companies will do a lot of this to get all their materials uploaded into this kind of a, an AI service. Many of them are doing it for um, their website service and Q&A and things like that, although this is really deep. So for salespeople, all kinds of ways to use AI. You can use AI for using something like chat GPT. You can use AI to help you research and prospects, keeping in mind that it's not completely up to date. It's not up to date right now, but it's up to date for a year or so ago. And um, so that's one thing. A lot of salespeople are using AI in messaging to um, create emails, uh, voice messages, scripts, things like that. I have the advantage now I can go to Barbara AI and ask for things and get my own material back 
in different form there. It's like a video script or something like that. So it's a lot of fun to do it. If you don't have your call cloud, you can do the same thing on chat GPT and you can get outlines of things. You can get the structure of something. So if you need to do a proposal, you can give it information about your business and what you need to do and ask it for a proposal and it will give you the structure that you need, even if you have to change some of the content. Very time saving for things like that. I've also used an AI technology called SlideSpeak, which allows you to what they say interrogate a document. So what I did partly as I was building the institute, I was doing courses. I would upload the PowerPoint of the main content and I would ask it for a summary full summary, a 50-word summary. Then I would ask it for a list of the topics. Then I would ask it for a quiz. And it would write a quiz. It would write me six or eight quiz questions, multiple choice questions with answers. So even the raw answers were in there. And I would say about six of every eight questions that it produced were usable for me. You could also do the same thing with a Word document, anything that you want to summarize, anything that you want to repurpose in a different way or turn it into a little script that a salesperson can use for an outgoing video to a prospect or a customer. So there are just infinite ways. I used a couple of services that create videos from text. So, for example, I could put a blog post in there and turn it into a video. So I have reused material. Yeah, I mean... Those are some of the ways I use it now. A few of the ways, right? That was a lot of different ways. And I do think uh, people are still intimidated by AI. And when we talk about these, you know, privately held businesses or family businesses, people are busy running their business, their company. And so... They don't have a lot of time to investigate AI, but as you said, really, it's it's user friendly. I have my videos like this one transcribed, and that's there are so many different options to do that. And then put that into AI and say, what are the top 10 tips and what are the top 10 action steps? And of course, The thing with AI that you know and everybody talks about, you have to edit it. You can't just take what it creates. Of course. Uh, And we I've used that too for for art, for artwork. And that's pretty interesting because I did a presentation where I was talking about the fact that you need to make your customers feel like rock stars. And Mm -hmm. I was talking about a story where my husband and I went to Hawaii and we were in a kayak. And we asked AI to generate us looking like rock stars. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it took a few tries and the yeah. end result was super entertaining. Uh, but one thing I've noticed too, when you put things in AI for artwork anyway, the numbers and the letters are all mixed up. So I'm not sure what that is about, but I'm sure it will be fixed. Uh, yeah, I but yeah, I, I've got my whole book that I put into AI to summarize it. So as you said, content, repurposing content. I kind of laugh because, you know, companies like Grammarly, where it would check the grammar of your email and you being a former English teacher, you know all about that. And I'm also uh, picky about grammar. And so now you can use AI to do that and so much more. So, yes, as a salesperson, it is it is so valuable. So let's talk about, you know, your new platform and membership, which is the Will Hunters Institute, and I know you have some uh, giveaways, some some ways to get acquainted with the platform. Yes. Well, as I said, the Will Hunters Institute is an online learning platform about large account sales. It has a huge amount of information and courses and things in there. We have a free trial available. It's a two-week free trial. You can just go to the whalehunters.com and it's very visible how to get to the Institute and free trial. We'd love for any of your salespeople to try it out. And after the free trial, it's $29 a month. Then it, this includes the cloud, which is a coach. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. So I hope people will try it out. 
Yeah, give it a try. That's super reasonable price too. I'm curious, do you have courses within the platform that talk about AI then and how to use AI? We're developing that. It's not in there yet, but it will be in there and working on. I'm actually working on um, a flip book about all of the AI that I used in putting the Institute together, and that should be available in a couple of weeks. You know, things are changing and more options are becoming available so fast. Uh, it's just, you got to keep up with all of this stuff that's going on. So for sure. Uh, you also said that you have a giveaway, a cheat sheet or something about how to stop scaring your buyers. So tell us a little bit more about that. Well, that small companies, great and large companies for a lot of reasons, um, they're, they're small size, they're, they're unknown. They don't, think you have systems and processes like they do. So you have to overcome or mitigate these fears before they'll buy your advantage. You have a lot of advantages, including flexibility, agility, speed, that they can't get with bigger customers. But the first thing is the individual buyers, they're afraid of making a mistake. They're afraid of more work. They're afraid of internal conflict. So we have this um, I think it's called by top ways to stop scaring your whales and it's available. You'll see it right in the early pages of the whale and there's where we have resources and it's free. Yeah. And, and of course for buyers, sometimes the status quo is the least scary. It's, you know, no decision is a decision. So it really does make sense to strengthen your arsenal to, to, help the bigger companies realize the advantages that a smaller company can provide, which definitely are many. So um, So when you when you determine the fears, then we have a system to help you develop fear busters, which are tangible things you can use in your sales process. Now, can you happen to give us an example of what one or two of those might be? A fear buster? Sure. Yeah. Suppose they're worried that you're not going to send your A team, that you're going to send people to do the work that they don't appreciate. So a fear buster would be your, your plan for putting the people on this job or your list, ideally your list of people who are going to pre- pre- do the business with them, you know, serve them. Another example would be, um, if they if they don't recognize the town where you're from, if they think you're kind of backwater, then get a mailing address in your nearest city and use that instead. Just little things. Um, create an onboarding process. A lot of things go wrong when you bring a new company on board because there's so many new people involved on both sides. You need a really detailed, specific plan of who is going to do what, how that works. Then turn that into a process chart and share it in the sales process so that they know you have a process that they can count on because they have processes for everything. So as a small company, start thinking about all the processes that you do that aren't written down. (laughs) Start writing them down step by step, give them a name and a trademark. And then you have something to offer that nobody else has because you trademarked your thing. Well, and the onboarding is is important. And and I'm glad you brought that up because as salespeople and a lot of sales trainers, it's all about finding that moose or finding that whale, doing the preparation giving them your value proposition and convincing them, persuading them that you are the best option. But in, you know, unless you're a one and done sales person, uh, like you're going door to door selling solar or something, almost all salespeople that we deal with are relationship sellers. So it's a really good point to talk about the fact that once the sale's made, that is not the end. Right, exactly. That's the beginning. (laughs) And that's where the real power of sales numbers come from, you know, being very strategic in not only getting new customers, but keeping those old customers happy. And new business with those current customers, which doesn't happen if they have a bad onboarding experience. (laughs) 
right? And how much it costs to get a new customer rather than keeping a customer. So the onboarding and then what happens after that is critical to your success long term. Mm -hmm. So you've given us some great tips in this 30 minutes. And I wanted to know if you have any closing advice, anything that someone can do right away, uh, a salesperson or a sales leader that's listening, what would be the first step you would recommend? I would say they don't have any kind of system really for learning about a prospect before they go in to do a little bit of research, either do some AI research or find whatever you can find on the internet about that customer so that when you go in the door, the questions you ask are intelligent questions that you could answer online. So then you get better answers from the people you're talking to and you learn more quickly about what they do. So you need to prepare yourself as well as you possibly can before you ever go in the door when they're big. That's that's a very good recommendation. And of course, it shows the buyer that you've done homework, that you are invested in this relationship. Uh, you know, if you go in and just ask, you know, really dumb questions that you could have found on their website, that's not going to impress them for sure. So. Well, those are great tips. I want to tell the listener that you can find Barbara and her clone at thewhalehunters.com. So it's thewhalehunters.com. And Barbara is actually Barbara Weaver Smith, just like it sounds. And that's where you can find her on LinkedIn. And when you check out thewhalehunters.com, you can look at the in the Institute and give it a try. I recommend that. So, uh, Barbara, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Kay. I really enjoyed chatting with you. And I encourage your readers, if they're uh, your listeners, if they have any questions or interested at all in whale hunting, just drop me an email. I will definitely respond. So I assume that's Barbara at thewhalehunters.com? Correct. It is, yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. Well, thank you once again. Thank you, Kay. Thanks for listening to this episode of Uncopyable Women in Sales, your source for secrets you can use to make more sales. Check the show notes for links and contact information. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please spread the word by subscribing, sharing, and leaving a five-star review. You can always learn more by going to uncopyablesales.com slash podcast. Until next time, go out and supercharge your sales like a true uncopyable rock star.